Good morning. Y'all look good today? You can see your faces out there today. And uh, we are in Numbers chapter 13 as we continue this sermon series on worshiping in the wilderness. Today we're talking about having courage in the midst of fear, in the face of fear. You know, I read a quote that said this, that courage is doing what you're afraid to do. Courage is doing what you're afraid to do. There can be no courage unless you're scared. So uh, it stands to reason that without fear, there is no courage, that courage exists because there is fear. And you've probably heard before, too, that courage is not the absence of fear. It is standing in the face of fear. Well, speaking of fear, Halloween was last night. And uh, did you know that Halloween is the second most popular holiday behind Christmas? Did you realize that? In America, for, for the amount of money that is spent, how much do you think Americans spend on Halloween uh, every year? What would you guess? Would it be in the billions? It is $8 billion Americans spend on Halloween. Now, they believe it dropped a little bit this year. But the people who did take place in Halloween said that they planned on spending more than they, than they uh, normally would. So that kind of made up for those that didn't participate this year. And you think about this, what is so great about Halloween? Like, what is it about Halloween? Well, uh, what, we know that the big issue is that children get candy, right? That's really uh, the point of the American Halloween. Uh, and then people get to see children smile when they get the candy. And, and, and now, more so now than it ever has been, people of all ages get to dress up. They get to wear costumes. And for one night, they pretend to be someone else. So uh, American Halloween is, is, a, is really a source of fun for all sorts and ages of people. But Halloween itself is also rooted in fear. It's rooted in fear. Halloween, of course, you may know as pagan roots in which it was a holiday or, or a, a time of the year where, where the ancient Celts would wear costumes, dress up like uh, animals and things to ward off ghosts. So Halloween started because people were scared of ghosts and evil spirits and those kind of things. So still today there is that fear factor associated with Halloween. And I believe that's part of the appeal that so many people like it. Because there's something in many people that when they're scared, they kind of like it. Or they view it as an opportunity. They, they, they like to face that fear. And facing fear is what we call courage. This is why I believe haunted houses are so popular. Because people know they're going to be scared. And it makes them feel good to kind of stand up to a fright. It makes them feel good to have courage. And I think that that's the case because we all have courage deep down inside of us. I think that as Christians, God has called us to be courageous. And so I think Halloween and haunted houses and roller coasters and, and frightening things like that, I think it taps into something that we know we're called to have. And so when we show courage in a fearful situation, we feel like we have done something good. We feel like we've accomplished something. We actually feel good when we stand up successfully to fear. We're looking at a passage of Scripture today where God's people had a chance to be courageous, but they weren't. They had a chance to stand courageously, but they didn't. And they looked at fear in the face, but the majority of God's people didn't have the courage, didn't muster up the courage to face that fear or conquer it through faith in God. So Numbers chapter 13 Starting in verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. Of Israel. Now skip down to verse 17. It says that Moses sent them 
to spy out the land of Canaan, and said to them, Go up into the Negev and into the hill country, and see what the land is, and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. I'll skip down to verse 25. Now at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea all along the Jordan. Verse 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so... We seemed to them. Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship today, we come across this passage, this key passage in your redemptive history of the people of Israel and God's and your own people, where you had promised them all the way back to Abraham, Lord, that you're going to make them a mighty nation. You promised Moses that you would take your people to a land flowing with milk and honey. And Lord, they saw the milk and they saw the honey. But they also saw other things that scared them, frightened them. And like a little child who doesn't want to go to someone's porch because an adult is dressed up in a costume to get the candy, Lord, they stood there on the brink And did not muster up the courage that you would give them, Father. Lord, as we look at this passage today, there are many things in our world, in our lives, that cause us to fear. Help us have courage as we put our faith in you, not in our own selves, so we can do what you've called us to do. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God's people, as we saw a few weeks ago, first they complained. Then the complaining led to criticism. And now the criticism is leading to full-fledged fear. So I want to give you today three truths about fearful situations. Three truths about fearful situations. Number one, God often assigns us potentially fearful situations. God often assigns us potentially fearful situations. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, said, Send men to spy out the land, which I am giving to you. Now, I'm giving you this land, but go ahead and get there early and spy it out and have an idea of what you're getting into. But I am giving you this land. God didn't say, I might give it, I may give it. He says, you're having it, you're getting it. So go and spy it out. And he said, from each tribe, send 
a chief. Send a leader. Don't just send some other person. Send someone who has, who has earned that in some way to be that leader. They have a track record of good leadership. They have a track record of doing good things. Send out those men, because that's the kind of men I need to spy out that land. And so they did. Men who were heads of the people. For two years, they had been wandering through the desert, being nomads on their journey to the promised land. And God had them in the wilderness for two years for several reasons. One, that he had to give them the law. He had to establish a nation. He had to establish proper, orderly worship. He had to create the 12 clans, which they called tribes. It took two years, and it would have taken a shorter amount of time if the people had not complained and criticized and sinned against God. But now they're on the edge of the promised land. There they are. What they had been waiting for, the goal, it's right there. So God says, go, see what you are up against. I promise I will give you this land. It might not be easy, but it's going to be yours. There's a story of an old Scottish woman who went from house to house years ago in the countryside selling thread and she would sell uh, buttons and shoestrings. You know, sometimes it's hard to find a button, a good button. You couldn't go down to Hobby Lobby back in the day, right? And so she would sell these things from house to house. And when she came to a road that was unmarked or a crossroad and didn't know where to go, she had this stick, and she would throw the stick up in the air, and then the stick would land on the ground, and whatever direction the stick was facing, she'd take that road. Sounds like a good way to go, right? One day, somebody saw her tossing the stick up, and down again, threw it down, picked it up again, kept tossing it up and down, and kept landing. She kept picking it up, and he said, why are you keep doing that? Why do you keep throwing it up in the air? Aren't you supposed to go where the stick says? She said, it keeps pointing to the left, and I want to take the road to the right. <laughs> so she kept throwing the stick into the air until it pointed the way she wanted to go. Many people know God's will for their life, but they refuse to do it because it's not the way they want to go. Amen? We know what that's like. And this is what the Israelites are doing. God says, this is the way. This is your way. And they're like, wait a second. Okay. And so we see this. God God is not in the business of giving us easy assignments because if it's easy, then why do we need him? It might not be an assignment of God if it's easy. Kingdom assignments are so big, they need God to work through us. And this naturally leads us to fear because we know the monster on the other side of the road is too much for us to handle on our own. So we need to recognize that there's something God is leading us to go or do, and it'll probably be scary. And because it's scary, it's maybe God's plan. So we need to understand that God often assigns us potentially fearful situations because he wants us to trust in him. Secondly, God always equips us for these situations. If God has called us to it, he is going to equip us for it. We're never not going to have what we need. We're always going to have the tools that we need. We may not feel prepared, but we are prepared if God has called us to do it. Verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land. And he said, go into the Negev and go into the hill country. See what it is. See if the people are strong or weak. See if there are few or many. See, see if the land they dwell in is good or bad. See what the cities are like. See if they're, they're poor. See if there's trees. Let's just get good intel. Let's just see what it's like. I'm giving it to you, but at least you know what you're coming into. At least you have an idea. And it says here that now the time was the season for the first ripe grapes. And I'll explain what that means in a second. But let's look at how God equipped the Israelites for the challenge. First, he gave them the plan. He gave them the plan. He said, go, spy out the land. We don't know what they would have done if God not said it, said that. They might have just went on in the land and marched on in there. He said, spy it out, get intelligence, make notes about the people, gather the information. And secondly, he gave them the timing. 
So you can have a plan is one thing, but you need to know when to execute the plan. And he gave them that, when the time was to come. It was the time of the first ripe grapes. Fruit was bearing across the land. It was important that God sent them at this time. So, verse 21. They went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob near Lebo Hamath. And they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Talks about the descendants of Anak were there. And then in verse 23 it says, And they came to the valley of Eshkel and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two of them. And they also brought some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkel because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. So as they spied out the land for 40 days, God's showing them that you'll be fed. You'll be cared for. It's the time where everything's uh, bearing, fruit's bearing, things are blooming. You're going to have to eat off the land. This is a Navy SEAL type assignment. We're dropping you in the wilderness. You're, there's, there's no backup. We're not coming to get you. You got 40 days to get intel. What are we going to eat? He's like, I have provided that for you as well. The land is bearing fruit. You got figs, you got pomegranates, you got grapes. They were roughing it for over a month, sleeping on the ground, gathering information, all while God was taking care of them as they were doing it. So they could literally see, they could literally taste and literally see that the land was good and that God had not lied to them, that it was flowing with milk and honey and it wasn't the desert. It was a good place to be. And they traveled all around the area and they got good information. See, God is going to equip us. He's going to give us the plan. He'll give us the timing if we follow him and listen to him. So we see that God always equips us for the potentially fearful situations. And number three, however, we often doubt God in these fearful situations. We often doubt God in these fearful situations. Look at verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation and the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them, to all the congregation. They showed them the fruit of the land, and they told them, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. This is its fruit. I can see them coming back. I imagine they were all excited. They've come back unharmed. All 12 of them come back. They come back with all this fruit. Look, it was a great, we saw all this. It was fantastic. We got all this great fruit. I've never seen fruit like this before. It's a great land. It's wonderful. And everybody's like, all right, we're getting ready to go. And they're like, but (laughs) one thing, (laughs) the people are scary. Look at verse 28. The people who live in the land, they're strong. Cities are fortified and they're large. I don't know how, how we're going to get in the cities. We gotta, I mean, we can't just, just go into their land. This is their land. So I think they're starting to understand in order to take the land, they're not just going to get up and leave. Oh, yeah, take our homes, take our cities. <laughs> Welcome here. They understand they're going to have to fight them. So they're thinking, well, how is that going to happen? They're stronger than us. They have armies, fortified cities. We're not going to be able to do that. I know God told us to it happen, but I don't know how that's going to happen. How is that going to happen? See, we, we often start thinking about things humanly when God has told us what to do. We start thinking of logical things. Well, I don't know how that's going to work. I mean, you know. God says, but look at this. We can't, I don't know that. Have you ever scaled a wall before? No. Have you ever led someone into battle before? No. I don't know how to do that. All we've done is fled. We fled from Egypt. We didn't fight anyone. We're good at running, not warring. They're intimidated. God doesn't always tell us what the future, how he's going to work in the future. We start to fear and to make it worse, the descendants of Anak were there. These were giant warriors. These just weren't the warriors. They were these giant warriors. Right? 
You know, I get the feeling that this would be like if, I, if me and, and Colby and some of you uh, put on a, football, a couple of football uniforms and some helmets, got on the football field and started warming up. And I looked over and there's a, there's, I'm trying to think of a, of, a, of a pro football team. Who's the good football team? I was going to say the Cowboys. They're not any good this year, are they? There's, there's the old Patriots used to be good, right? There's the Patriots out there. Uh, it would be intimidating. They'd be like, whoa, we can't, we can't go against these guys. We can't go against these guys. This is what they would have thought. These are giant warriors, verse 29. Then they said this. We get the Amalekites. They're in the Negev. Then there's the Hittites. And then we found the Jebusites, and then we saw the Amorites in the hill country. And then by the sea, there's the Canaanites all along. There's people to my left, people to my right, all around, everywhere. This is not just some deserted land. These are people. We're going to have to fight all of these people. Do you realize that? I don't want to do that. They're not just going to give us the land. God's told us this is our land. We're going to have to war with these people. Unless they just let us in, which they probably won't. There were threats on every side. But look what Caleb says, verse 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up now. We know where we're getting into. They don't know we're coming. We know where they are. They don't know where they're. We can do it. Let's overcome it. If this happened in our world today, you would just say, oh, oh, Caleb, young, young Caleb. <laughs> you know, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not how the world works, Caleb. That's not how it is, Caleb. These people were big. We're not big. These people are strong. We're not strong. His faithful optimism just got shot down. Why was he optimistic? Because he was courageous. He had faith in God. But the other leaders of the clans did not. The other men. Now these are warriors. These are the, the SEAL Team 6 of Israel. And they're scared. So it was obviously a fearful situation. Not making light on the situation. It was fearful. Caleb said, no, 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 this is what we need to do. This is what we're going to do. The men say in verse 31, we're not able, Caleb. They're stronger than us. And that's right, they were. And that's why they needed God. Because they started to view the situation from a human standpoint. And when we start to view the world and our situation from a human standpoint and not a God standpoint, from an from a earthly standpoint and not a kingdom standpoint, is when we will be able, not be able to, we will be paralyzed in fear. We start viewing things from a human standpoint. Did you know that there's a big election on Tuesday? Did you know that? Big election on Tuesday. Many people on both sides, if you're Republican, you're scared to think, what in the world's going to happen if Biden wins? And if you're a Democrat, you're thinking, what in the world's going to happen if Trump wins again? Now, to be honest, there are reasons to be fearful of an election. Just like the Israelites had real reasons to be fearful. But when we look at things like Tuesday, we can't look at it as Christians from a human standpoint. We can't look at it from a logical, literal, in the weeds standpoint. We have to get up out of the trees, out of the forest, and look at it from a kingdom standpoint and a kingdom picture. And as Christians, that no matter the results on Tuesday, no matter the results the next four years or in 2028 or 2032, that God is bigger than any situation we're in. Any situation. It might feel like the end of the world one day. But you know, feelings aren't always the truth. Did you know that? Feelings aren't always the truth. Look what verse 32 says. 
So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone is a land that devours its inhabitants. Well, that's just a flat-out lie. The land was, was flowing with milk and honey. They lied about it. Fear makes us do things we shouldn't do. And all the people we saw in it are a great height. It wasn't a realistic report. It wasn't like, here's what we saw. We saw these good things. We saw these difficult things. You know what? These are difficult. We're going to need to pray about these things, and they're going to need to trust God. That's not what they said. They said, the land's horrible, rough place to live, devours its inhabitants. And the people are tall, so we're not going. It was a bad report. See, it's important to report the facts and then decide what the, what's good about them, decide what's fearful, and then pray about those that are fearful and good, and then seek the Lord and then go about doing it. All great opportunities came because there was a problem. Problems give opportunities. Verse 33. And we saw the Nephilim. These are the real giants. Supernatural people almost. And we seem to them like grasshoppers and so we seem to them. How do you know what you seem to them? Because if they had seen you, they would have killed you. They didn't see you. Oh, we looked small to them. They looked big to us. The task was too much. So instead of doubting God, we need to have courage. Now next week we're going to see what happens. We're going to see how their fear did not lead to courage. It led to rebellion. Rebellion led to disobedience. And it all started with complaints. Complaining to criticism to fear which is where they are now, where they are now. There's a story of a mother, a four-year-old daughter were going to bed at night. You know how four-year-olds, they go to bed so easily. <laughs> and a child, a little girl, like most little girls, who's afraid of the dark. And uh, the mother uh, was, was, you know, was laying with her and said, this is legitimate fear that she has, you know. And the mother couldn't get to sleep either. She was worried about all kinds of things. They just both laid there. And the little girl said, Mom, is, is the moon God's light? And she said, well, yes. Yes, it is. The moon is God's light. She said, will God put out his light and go to sleep? <laughs> she says, no, 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 baby. God never goes to sleep. And the little baby said, well... As long as God is, both, is awake, there's no sense in both of us staying awake. We go to sleep at night, God's still there. Monday will be here, Tuesday will be here, Wednesday will be here, and unless Jesus comes back, which will be good for all of us, God will still be there. And he'll be there Thursday, and he'll be there Friday, and he'll be there Saturday. He'll be there no matter what. Even if Clemson wins another national championship, God will still be there. He'll still be there. When we face fearful situations, God calls us to have courage and to put our faith not in ourselves, not in our situations, not on what we can see, but on Him. Heavenly Father, as we close our time together today, we thank You for who You are. Lord, fear is a real thing. Halloween is a reminder of that. It's, it taps into just the everyday person's soul that there's something about being frightened that is unsettling. So, Lord, when we reach the fearful times in our lives, Lord, I pray that we will be fearful and we will, we will feel that fear but then we will then go to you. We will be courageous as you give us the strength, as you prop us up, as you call us 
to face that fear. Lord, I can think of all of the, the Christians for thousands of years who have paid the ultimate price for their faith. On their knees, facing the sword, knowing, and I'm sure they were fearful, knowing that their life was coming to an end. But in that fear, they had courage as they would not deny you. I could have lived if they would have denied you, but they didn't. And why did they not do it? Because they know that you are everything. You are the author of life. You are the giver of life. You saved them from a certain death, a certain eternal punishment, Lord. And so we thank you for sending Jesus Christ for us. We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to us. Lord, so that he, through his life and his, and his death and his burial and his resurrection, that all who place their faith in him would have eternal life. There's no fear in that. There's no fear in our death anymore. But we thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus. And as we close today, Lord, we ask these things in his name.